welcome everybody to our second read in our course of uh, market um, uh, critics. Uh, I am delighted to introduce uh, Fernando Ortiaga, who is a senior fellow and the academic director of the Penn Initiative of the Student of the Market. Fernando will teach a lecture today about the morality of, um, of markets. So welcome, Fernando, and welcome, everybody. And please send uh, your questions to the Q&A uh, bot. Thank you very much. Welcome, Fernando. Thank you, Ivan. Today's discussion will be on the morality of markets. In your previous session, Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde discussed the quote by Keynes when he said that an economist, in order to be a good economist, should go beyond just economics. He should be a mathematician, a statistician, and a philosopher, among other things. Today, we're going to discuss precisely why this is the case, why an economist needs to go beyond just explanations of economic phenomena through an economic framework by looking into some of the moral qualms that people had when dealing with markets. So some people really dislike markets, not because of the outcomes that they produce, but they, because they dislike the process by which these outcomes are actually produced. For example, this picture comes from a news in, in Texas that became very notorious in 2017 after the Hurricane Harvey hit the Texas and Louisiana. And it shows precisely how bottles of water have increased their price in almost 10 times what their normal, quote, normal price should have been. So a lot of discussions around this occur precisely because it deals into the phenomena of why this occurs in the very first place. Why should a supermarket should be profiting from the necessities of people that are in times of need? Remember, the Huracan Jairbe really hit hard Texas in this point in time. A lot of people actually lost their homes, lost a lot of their property, and so they were in really a time of need. So why do supermarkets increase the price of water in these really harsh times on the people? Of course, the economics explanation would be because the relative scarcity of water increase. So either through the shock that decreased the supply of water or increased the demand of it or whatever reason, but we know that there is a larger scarcity of water. So it is natural that in a market, the price should increase. That is to be expected. That is the economic explanation that we give to this kind of phenomena. Nonetheless, this response, of course, is totally unsatisfactory to most of people that believe that this should not be the case. That in times of need, precisely in times of need, markets should not actually be working. There should be an alternative to it. Water that is a need for people to exist should maintain the quote, normal value that it had on normal times. Supermarkets should not be profiting from this. People, the community, the state should do something about it. This is wrong. This is morally wrong. This is what people believe what price gouging is. And this is why they sometimes abhor markets. This is a moral claim against market working. It is not an economic uh, discussion around it. It is a moral debate surrounding the pricing mechanism in times of need. There are many discussions that we can have around certain markets that people really dislike. So this other one, this is a book, The Red Market, that was written by a journalist, Scott Carney. So you won't find any economic analysis here, but you would find it's a very in gruesome detail, a very harsh read, honestly, that details the process by which certain people around the world in certain communities, because of their conditions, have been led, that's a, a, a word, have been led to actually sell their own body parts. Should people do that? Is this something that we should expect when markets exist? If people do not have anything else to produce, should they sell their own body parts in order to survive? Is this something that we as a human societies should actually think that is a positive uh, advancement in how we behave? Is it? So many people would have heard that. Many people really dislike this type of things. It is not just about selling of your organs. It's about many things related to our own biological beings. If we believe our body is sacred, then why should it be commodified in the very first place? There are many important discussions surrounding as that. 
Again, if we just had a pure economics discussion, we will be led to believe that, yes, this is something that if you voluntarily agree to exchange your own kidney and sell it for a given amount and you willingly sell it, then yes, that's okay. That's something that you should do. And that would produce more or less the optimal outcome because that's how economics and market works. That is more or less the, the, the an economics response that you would be having. But once we go beyond just pure economics, we find that there's some natural repugnance that this lets to have in people, in us, even economists sometimes really dislike this kind of things because they believe, in, because they are, of course we are human beings in our inner selves, that there's something wrong here. <clears throat> there is something that it should not be happening. So I could go, go and on and on about many other examples in terms of organs, for example, surrogate motherhood is another aspect, a little bit less contentious because it does not involve the selling of my own parts, but it involves the selling of my body parts as a, 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 um, as a way to, to basically bear your, your other child and so on. So it's also contentious, not as much as organs, but it's also contentious. One thing that is maybe not as contentious, but still very politically relevant is the minimum wage. Again, if we would look into just a keonomic sphere, which nowadays has an enormous literature, the traditional understanding about why minimum wages don't work, that more or less was the status quo, the mainstream approach towards the, this problem up until the 90s, I would say, is that the minimum wage imposes a price floor on labor. And hence, if you have if you provide less productivity to any given business, then the, the, the result that will be produced is not that you will be hired and given more wage. The result is that you will be unemployed because the potential uh, employer would not want to actually hire someone that will bring less than what he's paying for. That is a natural understanding of what minimum wages could be harmful to society. Of course, nowadays, the economics literature has provided more, more, more discussion about it uh, surrounding the idea about if there are certain conditions like monopsony and so on, it could be the case that minimum wage actually is economically optimal. And that is the way that we as economists discuss. And you will find many ink being discussed about this in economic journals. And this is very quite contentious within economics. But when we talk about this phenomena, in the non-economic sphere, in the non-economically scholar academic fields, we see that this transcends the just economic jargon. It transcends the economic understanding. It goes again to our moral inclinations about how we think about what should be a, a, a wish that people should have in order to sustain themselves. This is a quote by the then President Barack Obama in 2014, where he says that, in fact, about three in four Americans support raising the minimum wage because they believe that in the wealthiest nation, we believe that in the, in the wealthiest nation on earth, nobody who works full time should ever have to raise a family in poverty. Key aspect here is should ever have to raise a family in poverty. Minimum wage, sh minimum income should be the minimum necessary for everybody here. And here is not a discussion about if the minimum wage is the best means to achieve that end. The thing is that they see that the minimum wage themselves is inherently positive because it provides a moral understanding about how we think about markets. In that sense, we may, as an economist, may embed it into moral constraints, just as when we do uh, some equations about the constraints of technology when we think allocation of resources, given our constraints of technology, given our constraints of geographical constraints. If there is a mountain, it's difficult to move goods, that is a constraint. If there is a lack of access to a technology, that is a constraint. There's maybe nothing that has invented, that's a constraint. Maybe moral things should be also embedded within our own understanding of things. We should take these things seriously. Economists should take seriously the moral qualms that people have. When we discuss the morality of aspects, then we'll always lead to an economic discussion of if should economics should think about it, of course. I've already talked to you about that, maybe we should. But then again, when we're doing a scholarly work, many economists believe that they, but we should not. And maybe when we're doing science, maybe maybe we should not. That is true. So for example, Milton Friedman here famously said 
that uh, he, he in the middle of the 20th century, of course, he produced one of the most important methodology uh, texts ever produced within economics, at least. It was very, very influential, the methodology of positive economics. In another work, he had this important work, quote, in which he said, science is science and ethics is ethics. It takes both to make a whole man, but only confusion, misunderstanding and discord can come from not keeping them separate and distinct, from trying to impose the absolutes of ethics on the relatives of science. And at least since basically the early 20th century, this other picture from the uh, painting from this, uh, this other guy here, he is John Neville Keynes. He's the father of the famous John Maynard Keynes. He is also famous for more or less introducing this category distinction between what is a normative and what is a positive assessment. Normative things are what should be, are ethical understanding of the world. What is, is a positive assessment. But of course, this is just looking into how things work. But once we understand how things work, we may also need to take into account some moral aspects of it. Not only in terms of how should things be, but also in terms of how these constraints act upon ourselves and our economic discussions, as I've previously been talking about. So my lecture today will focus very much on trying to understand how we arrive into this equilibrium. One I'm self equilibrium is how we arrive into the idea that economics should be a positive science. And I'm going, I'm not going to discuss if this is the best case scenario or the worst case scenario. I'm just trying to say that this is the way that it occurred. In a sense, it's a positive assessment of the development of economics through our moral discussions. In the second part of the lecture, I will go more in depth into our specific moral qualms about it. I, one thing that I, I want to stress a little bit before going uh, and, and explain this is that as in our previous discussions, Professor Michael Munger made a lot of emphasis on Adam Smith, for example, on his system of propriety, and he made a lot of fuss about his, his, his works, and I will agree 100% about it. But nonetheless, if there is one economist among all the profession, and it is a very important economist, that actually is a little bit skeptic, well, a lot of skeptic about Adam Smith as being proclaimed the father of economics as a discipline, that will be Joseph Schumpeter, this guy here. So Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde already talked a little bit about him, but beyond what he did as an economist in his own work, <clears throat> he also dealt a little bit with the history of economic thought. And he produced this large book, it's almost 1,000 words, 1,000 pages, sorry. Uh, I think it was unpublished when he, he died, so it was published later on by, by his wife. Uh, but it's a very, very large book. It covers a lot of time. And in this book, he provides an interesting assessment of how economics has developed. And he more or less is a little bit skeptic, well, a lot of skeptic about Adam Smith. He believes that a skeptic copied a lot of the ideas that became popular with him, that a lot of the innovations did not occur with Adam Smith, but occur earlier. It occur either in the Middle Ages, either in Europe or in the Middle East, or elsewhere in the ancient world. So he believed that it was an, it was needed to provide a gap from nothing to Adam Smith. There's some sort of transition that occurred. And I will follow more or less this path as well. What I want to assess is how do we arrive to economics as a positive science discipline when we have a lot of moral concerns about it, specifically when we, when we talk in the ancient world that it was a very moral world. It was very much devoted to assess, to understand economics or what they understood as economics as a moral discipline, as part of moral philosophy. So to start this discussion, we need, of course, to stress what economics is. And as we have previously discussed in our previous sessions, exchange is at the core of what makes humans humans. We may disagree about if there is some sort of monkeys or other species that are also trade uh, at the end of the day, but nonetheless, exchange still remains a very important of what makes humans humans. And when we discuss what economics is, we always tend to discuss in terms of what a price is, what price theory is, and or discussion of price theory as microeconomics as how we arrive into price system through our subjective and marginal valuations about things is fairly 
have been extended in the past 200 years, but nonetheless, that does not imply that other societies did not have to have an understanding about the price mechanism. As previously discussed, when Jesus, Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde discussed about these societies, they dealt in market exchange. Some of them could be maybe conceived as some sort of proto-market society. They had market interactions at large extents, like the Romans, for example. So of course, these societies had to find a way to justify why some prices were the way they are. Maybe not analytically speaking, in the sense that they were not trying to look into how the price system works in a scholarly way. But nonetheless, given that markets do exist, and private contracts exist, and private parties engage in buying and selling of goods, it is normal and it's expected that some disputes arise out of this conundrum because people will be disputing these kind of things. So we need to arrive into a proper framework in order to understand why prices are the way they are. And so when I talk about price theory in this framework, I'm talking about the theories and practices that societies societies have to determine this exchange radius. And when we actually talk about societies and how these societies determine, that means they actually accept some exchange radius, we are only we are already including moral constraints. We are thinking why people accept the minimum wage today, or why they do not, or why in the past they had this concept that we are going to discuss about the just price. Was that a relevant concept or not? We are going to talk about that. So again, when I talk about prices, I broadly understand in terms of trade as radio of exchange between type of goods. And at the end of the day, most of the discussions pre Adam Smith really are concerns about how to understand these radios of exchange in terms of fairness. Because one thing that I want to stress and I will stress throughout the lecture is that even though today we have whole many markets, we think that many markets are repugnant, such as the organ markets. A lot of people dislike the way that markets work in, the, in that world. Nonetheless, per, nonetheless, modern people, the modern world, the current society accepts markets. We have no problem going to a supermarket and engaging in market transactions. There we can find a lot of goods that come from different parts of the world, either through just extraction because they are food, well, there, there needs to be some sort of production in, in, in that as well. But generally speaking, food needs to consume corn, things like that, or more uh, capital goods. I don't know, there are machines that need to be produced as well. And these machines have a very large e e a vertical integration process by, by, to, to be produced themselves that need resources that are dispersed all throughout the world. And so all of these goods come from different parts of the world. They go to different parts of the world. They are manufactured in different parts of the world. They, they, are, they are redistributed to certain center nodes, and then they are redistributed and they, they go into the local supermarkets or wherever they are sold. And then you go and buy this good in your local currency and you have no problems with that. We accept this kind of thing. And you accept that you will be actually paying maybe a markup because this guy, I make a profit. The market would make the, the 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 businessman would make a profit, and that's okay with you because you are actually getting a benefit. Of course, you have the right to go to a certain place and not another. If there are two marketplaces, two supermarkets, you prefer to go to one to another because it's cheap or because it has some produce that the other ones that don't have. You have many choices and you have many decisions to make, but you accept the role here of the markets and you accept that this is this is good for you as well you take advantage of the system in that regard. We don't think that this morally negative anything about that. We think that there are some markets that should not exist, again, like the market of organs. But generally speaking, we think that markets are, uh, are, are, are things that we accept. But that was not the case always. So we should come to an understanding about how we arrive into this place. And a little bit of this lecture will be precisely to deal with this kind of problem through other discussions in the ancient world. And how those discussions led to the economic discussions in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. How do the medieval understanding of prices led to a ulterior understanding of prices that ultimately led to economics as a sign today and the way in which we understand markets today. So the way in which we I will proceed is first trying to define normative and positive. It's pretty relatively easy. Normative is 
basically just assessment about how the world ought to be should be kind of the typical uh, explanation of what it is, positive analysis of what it is. And that's kind of the discrimination distinction that economists try to do in order to assess that economics is interested in looking into how it is rather than how it should be. Policy making is another arena that is, of course, is connected with economics and it should be used within economics, but they say it is not. What I'm trying to say here is that even within economics, we need to arrive into an understanding into sometimes moral are taken to be a constraint. And this is the way it is. It sometimes has qualms about markets. That's the way it is. And the hence economics should at least be concerned about it. What I'm going to talk a lot about it is about the distinct debates in the medieval and the ancient world about the nature of prices and interest. So almost all of the examples I provided really are around if there is some sort of fair value to be provided to some sort of good when price gouging, for example, of it, maybe there is no fair value because there's no value at all that could be compensated for a human being, for an organ, things like that. Yes, that is quite relevant. Now, there is another aspect that is also connected with it, which is usury. We will see that usury, of course, is something that is also quite relevant today in terms of when you go, for example, I will provide just a quick example. If you have a, a problem and you may have liquidity problems, I don't know, you have a, a sudden a, a, an emergency that requires you to have, I don't know, $2,000 or $10,000, whatever. But there's maybe you don't have credit because you don't have a reputation. You are maybe a foreigner. For example, I am a Mexican. And one of the very difficult things to do as a foreigner is that you do not basically have the same ratings. So having credit historial in Mexico is not the same as having credit historial here. There's not a, a one to one. Um, nowadays, it's kind of even more easier depending on some banks, American Express and so on. If you have international presence and if you are a client in one country, then you can actually have credit in other country in that bank. But more or less, it's still quite difficult because even though there's a lot of migration and a, a lot of movement, still most of people remain in the country. So that means that institutions that are created are very country located. So that means that really, if you are a foreigner, you have difficulty actually getting credit. And hence, if you have an emergency and you don't have any savings fund, then you would go actually go into a char, a, a, a someone uh, that will lend you money that is perhaps not as regula not regulated. And hence, it is not regulated. It will actually provide you, maybe provide you with a loan, but an extort extortionary, and quote extortionary, because that's kind of a, a, a normative assessment of, of it, extortionary rates. What use would entails? What rate is extortionary? Well, that's something to be discussed. But nonetheless, people still believe that there is something wrong about actually charging interest rate, especially if they are large. But generally speaking, there's a uh, uh, general skepticism towards banks as a whole, even today, but it was much so in the past. So the discussion of usury and price are similar and connected in the sense that usury in economic terms, at least, is conceived to be the, 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 the price of intertemporal transactions. But that's very difficult to understand for the normal human beings, which do not see that way. They see that I'm getting $100 and I need to pay you $400 in two weeks. If that's a shark loan, for example. So why is that? Is that justifiable? Is that not justifiable? Those are the kind of things that are really, really hard because we'll say, well, this was voluntary because, but are you taking advantage of my own situation? Because otherwise I would not go into that exchange? Is this some sort of coerciveness being involved here? Is it not? So those are kind of distinctions that are quite really relevant to discuss. So what I will proceed is by first talking a little bit about ancient influences in the in price theory in the medieval world. So Aristotle, I will be devote a lot of time trying to discuss, even though I'm not a philosopher, and my attempt here is not to provide a philosophical explanation of what just price is through justice framework. I'm not going to try to less an economic understanding of Aristotle. And also we'll talk a little bit about how Christian attitudes or atavist attitudes in, of ancient societies influence how people think about merchants and about profit making as an activity, the merchant as a professional. We will talk about Roman law, because again, one thing is to theorize about how things should do in just for the sake of getting knowledge. But the other thing is that we know that markets exist and interaction exists and contracts exist. So we know that there's a need to solve economic disputes that arise in day-to-day -day basis. Because if, <clears throat> sorry, if I am a landlord and I lease my land to you and maybe you do not pay me, then of course I will complain. 
and or if I sell to you a land and you do not pay me, or basically you think you committed fraud, I committed fraud, things like that, there will be a lot of disputes. So how do you arrive into disputes? And a lot of the disputes will surround about compensation, about what if you sold uh, be beyond or below some certain fair price. So a lot of discussions that arose in that time are related really to discussions about the fairness of prices. And that led to three different medieval traditions. So the Romanist canonists, which are lawyers in different aspects, the Romanists will take mostly from Roman law. Canonists will basically, based on Roman law, will create a law on the church that will be quite influential. And then we will end up by discussing the general scholastic approach of it, basically the, the tradition of analyzing, analytically um, um, studying a lot of these aspects through reason, trying to find loopholes in the reasons in order to find truth. So what are the key questions that we are going to talk about? What were the medieval theories concerning the determination of price? What prices were considered legitimate or ethical? Was the theory of the just price the only or the most prominent guideline? And how was just price estimate? These are four of the questions that we'll be talking about. And a lot of what I will be discussing here comes from these sources, not all of it, but I would say if you want to so do you want to discuss a little bit more about it? I would recommend these three books. The most recent one is in the middle, Just Pricing the Markets by Charles Geist, which provides a, a nice and amenable summary of the many discussions around the just price from Aristotle to the medieval world and how that influences our own current understanding of economics. If you want to go more in depth into the scholastic world and how that change of perceptions, I would recommend Baldwin, not just his book, but in general, Baldwin has produced a lot of internet texts. This is already a little bit old, 70s. He produced a lot of texts in 50s, 70s, but it is quite interesting nonetheless. And if you want, want to go more in depth into Aristotle economic thinking specifically, I would recommend this book by Scott Michael. So let's start with Aristotle, because at the end of the day, uh, you say that almost all things that were sort of over plateau, as Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde told us last class. But first of all, us, first of all, the word itself of the concept of economics was not coined by Aristotle, but by Xenophon, which was an alumni of uh, a student of, of Socrates. But in his book that he called uh, Economics, that of course comes from Greek. Uh, or cosnomos, which is basically a management of the household, is more or less like, a, a, it's, it's not economics in the sense that we nowadays think about economics. It's more like management book about the, the administration of the household. The, the, one, the, the, the real texts that are concerned more about what we will talk about nowadays as economics are in Aristotle. Rather, in, most specifically in two texts, but they are spread throughout his, his works. But his most important economics text would be Nicomachean Ethics, and again, it's, it's economics, but it's embedded into the idea of ethics. And then on politics, because again, economics is also about politics. So this is Xenophon, and this is Aristotle. So as I previously said, I'm going to talk a little bit about justice framework in terms of Aristotle with an economic perspective. And again, I'm not a, a expert philosopher. I'm not an expert on Aristotle, but nonetheless, and I'm not going to provide uh, a specific definition of Aristotle because there are a lot of debates. One of the key issues, of course, when we look into the past, especially into the ancient world, is sometimes it's a little bit of ambiguous and there are a lot of interpretations out of that. So I will just provide one of the interpretations that I happen to, to, to favor and I think is the one that leads to, to our benefits or understanding the most. I will also not use kind of the same jargon that Aristotle uses because they are conflicting. This is one way to understand the Aristotelian framework. We all know, for example, that Aristotle's conception of justice and virtuosity, really we have this idea that being in the middle is what makes you virtuous. Extremes are vicious. So when you are Anything could be either either uh, vicious if it's if there's a lack of or there's a, a, a it, it's beyond what 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 you would need if you are if you, the moderation is the key to virtuosity. What we need to understand also is that Aristotle for for Aristotle justice is coextensive with virtuousness. So justice is itself thing that is virtuous and. There's one thing that I want to stress here that I think is quite relevant to understand Aristotle and our future understanding of justice, generally speaking. So the Greek world, the ancient world, was socially stratified. There was no conception of a unique social class. 
when we look into Plateau, for example, and the Republic, he identifies that there's this thing that we call the state, well, the, the public, the city state, that is basically, it has its own members. And uh, they have some members that are the core, the elite, the, 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 the citizens, but be, you, below the citizens, there are other sectors of society. Of course, at the bottom end, you have slaves. Slaves are perhaps still human beings, but they are just above being property. So they have little to no rights. And so in our modern world, of course, we no longer accept this kind of distinction, but nonetheless, it was relevant in the ancient world. And another distinction is also in terms of foreigners. Just if there is a city state, by definition, there are members of the city state. There are people that live within the confines of the city state. There are people that are non-citizens, have no right to, to vote and decide on the community, but nonetheless, live in the confines of the city. And there are people that are only passing by. And these are the foreigners. And these people have less rights than the citizens, of course, but less rights than people that live within the confines of the city. They have more rights than slaves, yes, but they're still foreigners. And of course, uh, in our modern world, we no longer have such such uh, strict ratification, the stratification in the sense that basically if you are a human being that more or less you, you are a citizen or a foreigner, but still a distinction of a foreigner. I'm a foreigner in the United States. You will say, well, I have almost all rights as a citizen, just the only thing that I cannot do is vote. And that is real, yeah, yes, that is true. But nonetheless, I have to overcome certain obstacles that a non-citizen, that a citizen has not to overcome. Of course, I have to pay to be here. I need to pay for a lot of things that are beyond, uh, what that are basically taken for granted for a citizen, like a social security number in the United States and things like that. So it's difficult to overcome. So even though by law, I'm very much the same as a citizen, except for purpose of voting, if you steal from me, I have the right to complain and I have the right to ask the police to compensate me in some sort, well, not compensate me directly them themselves, but to basically, uh, I have the right to justice in the justice system, right? And so things like that, of course, have changed and we are no longer in such a stratified world. We no longer basically think that citizens are just the people that have property, for example. We now believe that it's just men, for example. We now believe that there's basically a unit in that regard. Individuals, if they are human beings, share more or less a universal list of human rights. Now, that does not mean that there is not a key distinction in why and how we behave as a society. When we think about the state as a representation of the community, we still think that the state has a duty with the society as a whole, that more or less the responsibility of the state should be to provide for the general and social welfare of people rather than to appeal to particular individuals. If, for example, just to take an example of the modern world, a billionaire. There's a lot of discussion in, in, in popular arena about billionaires. So should billionaires exist? That's one question. Some people say, no, if, if you're a billionaire, you should not exist. We should take your all your income or your wealth because billionaires should not exist. And so I will not discuss if this is a good way to 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 argue about it because my my, my the, the purpose of the lecture is not about that it's just a kind of providing a framework and how these economic discussions have also a moral background right and so discussions about billionaires are about also about redistribute distribute justice in the sense that you think that this should be not the case that the social welfare should be above the interest of the individuals and so yes it may be the case that if i take your income and that's your i, I actually think that that's your income but I don't think that you should have it. And it should be redistributed to other people. That is a concept of distribute justice and refers to the idea that given that there's social stratification in the sense that there is a community and there's an individual, the community is above the individual. It's in that sense that I brought here, there's a superior to inferior relation. That is one way to understand how justice works. And that's how states work in several senses. The second sense is to commutative justice. And this is not a term that was introduced by Aristotle, but it relates to the idea that there are nonetheless private relations. There are private positions by which people interact with each other. And if I am equal to you, then you don't have rights over me and I don't have rights over you. I don't have the right to steal, for example, if that's a right. If property rights are assigned and you, we have that as a society, we have defined that one thing is mine, one thing is yours, I cannot go and coerce you into giving me things. That is violating commutative justice. And of course, this relates to a more like negative conception of liberty. 
in the sense that liberty is defined as things that you should not do. You should not take things from people that it violates commutative justice. And, but both of them interact. And again, I'm, again, I'm not trying to say that one is better than the other, but both of them are different conceptions of justice. A libertarian approach, for example, would say that everything should be commutative justice, that the government has no right to taxes because taxing is coercive. But uh, uh, more uh, another approach would say, no, it has right because uh, there's a certification and the rights of the people of well, however we define people, society, are above the, 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 the needs of this guy. And I don't know how this guy actually achieve the results that it has. So we have a right to actually tax him and redistribute those resources. Those things are quite relevant. Now, for Aristotle, and this will be pretty relevant for our current discussion, there's a third aspect of justice. So for, for, for Aristotle, there's the definition of corrective justice, which is commutative, and then what I would call reciprocal justice. What is reciprocal justice? It's because all of the things that I've, I've talked about are relationships between people in non-economic arenas. But for Aristotle, there's a proper category for understanding justice in economic exchanges. And here is where we introduce the idea that reciprocal justice is relevant. And here is where Aristotle makes a lot of arguments in economic terms. So we have previously discussed in Mike Munger, Professor Mike Munger's lecture about the importance of division of labor. So Aristotle already recognized the importance of division of labor. He actually has an example of two persons. One is a shoemaker and the other is a home builder. And what they do is that, of course, they have two different professions. They devote to two different things. They enhance, have enhanced productivity because they are doing two things separately. And then they go to the market to exchange their own goods. And then he tries to understand how does this occur? Well, how do we understand exchange. First of all, of course, is that in order for a home builder to exchange one house with a shoemaker, there needs to be what we could consider a proper quote, proper unquote, proper uh, ratio of exchange. What determines how many shoes should, ex should we exchange for a given house? Because of course it is kind of obvious and it is not well explained in, in, in Aristotle, but it's kind of it is kind of natural for us to think that a house would be more valuable than a shoe, even if a shoe is kind of the best shoe in the world. Still, the best shoe in the world should not be, generally speaking, more pricey than the world's property, because a property has more uses and people value it most. So naturally, I will talk more about that and how we do those assessments, but generally speaking, there's a natural inclination towards thinking that a house should value most. So there's no possibility that you should just change one on one. Then how about 1,001? I'm venting that ratio. That may be the case. That may be the case. 1,000 to 1. I don't know how that occurs. So uh, Aristotle says, well, these guys, if they voluntarily go, they more or less have the same inclination towards trying to understand what is fair for them and the exchange. Now, the problem and one of the key issues here that Aristotle provides is that he's not only interested in looking into exchange in itself, but looking into market activities as a whole. And so barter, of course, is a problem because if I want to exchange, if, one, if I am a shoemaker and then I want to have a house, then I need for the house maker to actually want, I don't know, 1,000 shoes, pair of shoes. And of course, that seems quite not, uh, we are skeptical that that will ever occur. I mean, it will have to be a very eccentric person, a very eccentric home builder that accepts that, 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 that aspect of it, right? So that's something that Aristotle wanted to study. And he says, well, that's why we have money. And so our story that is so common in our economic textbooks nowadays about the origins of money as a medium of exchange that solves this problem of double coins and so on, more or less arises. Of course, nowadays, our understanding has evolved and through Menger, for example, Menger on money created the, basically shaped the way in which we understand money. There are a lot of debates out there as well. I don't want to go into that, but nonetheless, money is quite relevant. The problem with money is that it makes, makes easier the transactions, but it also creates a lot of problems. It creates problems in terms of now people will start selling their own things for the hoarding of money. So now we start making discussions around the idea of profit making. I will talk more about that in the following slides. But here we have our understanding that yes, maybe exchange is natural in the sense that we both want what each of us have to offer and we both benefit, 
But then when the introduction of money, when, when we get the introduction that people start to actually producing, not for the sake of exchanging for their own needs, but for the sake of hoarding, that is what profit is labeled that most, most of the times. So is that sinful? Is that should be praiseworthy? Of, well, they did not believe that, of course. But these kind of discussions start happening. This quote is, is, is the one that uh, of the shoemaker and the home builder. You can read it on your own. So going beyond just what Aristotle is saying, I want to discuss a little bit about the church's teachings and how our attitudes have changed throughout time. One of the key arguments that I want to stress here is that there was more or less a first a negative attitude towards merchants and profit making activities, activities that are related to just making profit. That's what I'm referring to for the first uh, 2000, 1000 years after Christ. But after the Gregorian reforms, there was a change in attitude that more or less stems from the development and rescuing of Roman law, which I'm going to discuss in just a moment with the uh, Aristotelian thought and things like that. Those kinds of things will eventually lead to an understanding of markets that will eventually lead to our, to, to our current world where markets are accepted. So here we have two paintings. One is from Peo Poblio the Great. It's basically decreased the power of the church versus other churches and so on. That's why his name coined the Great. He was quite skeptical about merchants because they, 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 they he had a, a very, a, 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 I would say, atavistic attitude towards profit making. In the same sense, we have on the other painting, uh, Gregory, which is, again, one of the reformer popes that also increased the power of the church, but it basically led to, to, to or in modern institutions as, as we know it today. There's a lot of literature that emphasizes that the church, the Catholic church, was one of the most important institutions in developing go proper governance mechanisms that align interests between certain people that created coalitions that basically incentivized later on the origin of the state as a nation state that copied a lot of what the church had been doing and then that led eventually to the modern world. So, but let's look into the mistrust of profit ventures. Why was that the case? So if the exchange is reciprocal, the question of course is, how can there be any profit? If we both gain more or less the same, if I'm exchanging you an apple for an orange, then basically you gain an orange and I gain an apple. And we more or less, we tend to think that we value the same because we did an exchange. It was voluntarily and we would agree. But how can there be a profit? Again, Aristotle talked about, well, there's money and that leads to profit making activities, but how we can deal to that? Within Aristotelian framework, the way in which we morally understand this phenomena is by looking into the motives. And again, through a pure bar, if money acts just as medium of exchange, like it would be in a bartering system, then that stems, that actually leads to more to transaction as being categorized as legitimate because they tend to basically be reciprocal and they look to cover necessities. However, and this is a key issue, if you are a merchant that is selling things, not because you want to cover your necessities, but because you want to become rich and just start hoarding money, wealth, income, then, well, that's not virtuous at all. So that's kind of a natural understanding. All people have, like when you see a, a millionaire, you say, well, he's a hoarder. He has a lot of money. Why we do not actually confiscate all his money and divide them among all the people? Everybody would be happier. This guy should not exist. That is kind of the, the typical understanding of the mistrust of, of, of the merchant. How can we understand that besides just Aristotelian uh, and religious aspects of it? I would say that Generally speaking, it's not just through religion, Catholic religion. You can see that also in modern religion, but it's not just that. All across, all across the world, some societies really are not that much into trusting the merchant. I would appeal to evolutionary psychology a little bit here in the sense that we may have had, we as a society may be some sort of atavistic. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that we, biologically speaking, are no different than humans that had existed for 10,000 years, more or less. But culturally speaking, institutionally speaking, socially speaking, we now live in a very different world. Our ancestors live in caves, forests, they, they moved, they chased, they hunted. They live in societies of, I don't know, 100 people at most. That was one very large tribe, right? Nowadays, we live in a world of 7 billion people. When again, we consume goods 
that are being produced everybody all of, all around the world. So we are attuned to a system that is quite different to the world in the past. Nonetheless, psychologically speaking, we still kind of feel more or less attuned to the past. So in the tribal society, cooperation, of course, direct cooperation is seen as very important. However, in our modern world, you think about markets as being competitive. You think about, well, I will do better this thing. I will actually lower my prices. I'm competing with you in my in my market interaction. That So competition is highlighted. So is there a kind of a, a, a paradox here? No, it's just that in the case of modern societies, cooperation could only be done through market interactions. We are no longer in a world of 100 people. We are a world in 170 million people. We cannot directly cooperate with 7 billion people. I cannot cooperate directly with a farmer in China. I cannot cooperate directly with a, a, a worker in Germany or in Japan or whatever in the rest of the world. The only way for both us to benefit is through market interaction, through exchange. And so, but still, that's economics. Morally speaking, <clears throat> We still believe in benevolence and we still believe that maybe there's some sort of contradiction between the market and benevolence. I will talk more about that in the last slides of this lecture. So here are several examples. Uh, some of them may be not uh, accurate in the sense that they have been misinterpreted a little bit in, 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 in not, not in economics, not only in social science in general and religion. So for example, Matthew says, again, I tell you it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There's, some people argue that this is kind of a mistranslation of this, but nonetheless, there's a general stereotype, a general conception that church fathers were more or less skeptical about transaction because they did not like the idea of accumulation of material goods and they basically prioritized spiritual and they saw that there was maybe a conflict between each other. So Pope de Leo the Great, which is the guy that I just uh, uh, showed you in the picture, in the painting, he said, it is difficult for buyers and sellers not to fall into sin. He's saying, as much as I would want to, maybe, there's still, I find hard for these guys that devote themselves to trade, not to be sinners. And hence, they are not morally justifiable. So how do we actually arrive into that, that, that discussion? It's because we think that maybe at the core of exchanges, there is unquenchable greed, greed at the core. You want to become rich. If your motives are wrong, then and market interactions more or less incentivize you that, then that may be the case that markets are morally wrong as well. If profits are derived from lies, deception, cheating, and committing fraud, that's also problematic. But we tend to see, well, yes, that's the case. We will, will agree. But we will say that maybe markets incentivize you to do that. So markets may be wrong as well. And then there's more a political economy <clears throat> aspect here by which basically merchants, given that they achieve a lot of economic uh, power, they have the basically command the necessities of life. And technically speaking, merchants were not the elite of the medieval society, and so they were much despised. Elites, feudal lords, uh, kings really needed to borrow a lot of money sometimes, and really needed these merchant guys that were uh, very rich, but they disliked them. They knew that they had a power over them because they had borrowed from them. So they disliked them. So again, there's a general distrust of the merchants by the church that I would argue would not start to change up until the Gregorian reforms in the second millennium. Now, so far I've tried to discuss a little bit of some uh, approach of how the societies understood prices. But when we refer to day-to-day -day transactions, there will there's a need to understand how these people solve the disputes. And hence, I'm appealing nowadays to Roman law, which, of course, is quite relevant, as Professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde already discussed a little bit in the introduction of the course. Here, what we have is uh, uh, Diocletian and uh, Constantine, two very famous late emperors of the Roman Empire. And what I want to stress here right now, for the sake of time, is that Justinian, of course, among a lot of things that he did, he ordered the compilation of Roman law into this code, the Corpus Juris Civilis. That basically, there was a mess in terms of Roman law that applied to several times, periods, and so on. So he just wanted to have this, this, this unique code that was written in a book. 
So he ordered that to be written, and that's where most of the understanding of Roman law comes from, because he did a good job of, of recover, re recompiling the, this aspect. So one aspect that I want to emphasize here that I think is quite interesting and relevant is that when we look into the Roman world, sometimes with an economic lens, we tend to emphasize aspects like the public sphere of op that is full of price regulations. When you look into the problems of the late empire, you say, well, one hypothesis is that the Roman Empire fall, it fell mostly because of bad economic policies. You said inflationary policies, price regulations, control of prices. So the common grain, for example, was commonly, it was commonly regulated at least since the time of Augustus. And meat prices also were regulated by the prefects of the city. And most famously, perhaps, was the failed uh, maximum prices edict of Diocletian in 300-101. It has been heavily discussed by economics leaders to how this thing failed actually to, 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 to fulfill the, 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 the ends that it, it wanted to achieve. And again, we, we stress these kind of things, and then we may come to, to think that the Romans were actually much into non-markets because they had these aspects. And it is true in the sense that if we look into a macroeconomic sphere, a lot of these aspects may be wrong-headed. Economically speaking, they were not right most of the time. However, it's most as we see today, when we look into policy and that policy, we discuss it and we see sometimes that policy really does not follow from an economic, viable economic program. But that does not mean that we don't live in an, a market society. That does not mean that in the day-to-day -day interactions, we don't believe in markets. And that's what occurred in the, in the Roman world. So in the private sphere, we emphasize our conception of more or less freedom of bargaining is the concept that rules. So in all Roman law, it is accepted that the price it is derived from freedom of bargaining. What is freedom of bargaining? So uh, it is not only in, in the Justinian Code, you can see that being discussed by Roman important Roman lawyers like Ulpian and Paul. Paul here is not the church father, but a Roman lawyer. And we see that not only in the late empire, but also in other part, in, in other periods of the, of the empire, in the law of the 12 tables and the Theodician Code. So what we see is that there is a right to outwit. So what we stress here is that the, 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 what we stress here is that in Roman times, the freedom of bargaining approach emphasizes more or less that you have a responsibility of your own things, that you have a responsibility to your own property. Given that your property is your property, then you have a responsibility over it. And you have also the power and the right to go into the market and outwit other person. So in a bargaining process, that is how market interactions work through auctions and things like that, to bargaining process, then of course you have a right to try to offer, counter offer and so on. That is a right that you have as a seller and as a buyer. And very importantly, of course, is that once you sell or once you buy whatever thing you are selling or buying through a contract, then that is the value of it. Both, you both agree. You are owners, you are property right owners of the thing that you have. You go to a, a market, you bargain, and once you arrive into a, 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 a middle point, then you sell, you buy, and that's it. And so hence, you cannot claim to have suffered harm after that. You cannot rescind that contract. You cannot ask this guy to return you your good, or you cannot ask to be compensated because you already went to the market and you already bargained. That is kind of the most important uh, position that we have within, uh, within economics, within the Roman world. So there are some challenges, of course, to freedom of bargaining, and there's a, a, a large literature about the Roman law in terms of how they conceive the economics and Roman law, how they conceive prices in, in this period, mostly because there are exceptions to freedom of bargaining clauses. The first one, of course, is if you act with dollars, that means if you commit fraud or extortion. So, for example, the one most important, and that's something that we discussed in our previous sessions, if you put a gun against my head and you tell me, 
give me your stuff or I take your life, you could say, well, that's the market, right? You are trading your life for the good, your own goods. But the key thing is that I own both goods. So I, this is not a market. You are coercing me to actually make a decision over what I value things that I own already. So this is a violation of commutative justice. This is not exchange interaction. This is not market interaction. This is physical extortion and it is wrong. So if you do that, this is, you can rescind the contract. You can go to the jury and say, well, actually I was coerced into doing that. And we all agree that. What is most uh, important or relevant for our lecture today is the concept of liaison ordinance, which technically speaking is a legal doctrine that allows to us, uh, allow, allow Romans to rescind the land contract. It was introduced, quote, in the Justinian Code and was attributed to the times of Diocletian. It is weird because, again, Romans for most times have emphasized the importance of freedom of bargaining. But here they introduce a clause that says, well, there's one exception. And that is weird. That has caused a lot of concern to people that are interested in this because we do not know a lot about Roman law. So what we see is that uh, there are some elements, there are some people that believe, there are some scholars that believe that really this concept was introduced through connections in the eastern parts of the empire. So for example, there has been some connection being made between the Laetian Ormis legal doctrine and Talmudic law and the law of overreaching, but more or less stress that there, there are some exceptions to the process of bargaining. If there are some extremes, you should basically maybe you have the right to, to, to rescind the contract. So those kind of things, but are not in the tradition of Roman law, but not the least exist in the Justinian Code and they are called the Laetian Ormis. And of course, how do we estimate that compared to the real value of the thing, how do once we rescind the contract or we ask for compensation, then what is the right price? And the right price is mostly what we would consider a just in price. We'll talk more about this when we discuss the medieval world, because this is a concept that was mostly heavily discussed at that time. So moving on into the medieval world, what I want to emphasize here are basically throughout the three schools I already talked a little bit about, Romanist, Canonist, and uh, Theologian approaches, there is nonetheless an understanding, an scholastic approach of understanding. There's this idea that reason, that logic could allow us to find loopholes and it could actually attune or basically or uh, these, these theoretical aspects to an applied world. So these three guys more or less exemplify these three traditions. So in the in the in the left part, in this part, there's the grave of Odofredus, which is a very important Romanist lawyer in the medieval world. He's a grave in, in Bologna, the University of Bologna. In the center, we have Gratian, which was one of the most important canon lawyers. He created kind of the, the system of law that would rule the church for up till the 20th century, I would say. And of course, the most known of all is Saint Thomas Aquinas, which is a very important and very well-known philosopher. Let's... So what I want to discuss now is this quote by Berman, in which he basically emphasizes that what occurred here is that there was a continuation of Roman law in the medieval world, by which basically the uh, Romanists adopted the civil law tradition of Romans and adapted to their own circumstances through this scholastic approach. But what is interesting here is perhaps that there was a larger discussion on, around the concept of Lation Ormis. This was this idea that perhaps there were some sort of exceptions by which basically transactions could actually be overridden. And hence, we start to see a major discussion around the idea if they are overridden and if there are some exceptions around the, the, the when voluntary exchanges are not a good way to assess the value of things, there must be another way then. Then, well, what is it? How do we arrive into that? I will talk about that in just a moment. But one of perhaps the most interesting things that occur at the time is that just as what occurs nowadays when people invoke the, the a clause not to sue one another, because if you do not sign that clause, what it, what, what it occurs is that you basically create it with losses because there are some transactions that are not being created. If you think as one party that the other party would actually sue you, well, what's your incentive to actually engage in transactions with that party in the very first place? So again, during the 12th century, many civil law agreements emerged when both parties mutually agreed that they wouldn't actually, of mutual accord, both agree that they would not invoke lazy normals because they both agree that once that opportunity exists, then they actually are at the mercy of one another. 
and hence that this would be problematic. But again, by what legal mechanism was just price assessed? So given that the Romanists are pragmatic in the sense that they are really wanting to solve day-to-day -day problems, they want to look into that. They are not, this is not an scholarly pursuit. This is a problem that exists in terms of how to solve the disputes that arise out of the private interaction of people. So how do we do it? How did they do it? Of course, there was a magistrate, a visum judicious, that had, was a judge with discretionary powers. And what criteria did he, they, did he use to just price? And here we have all the Fredos that more or less gives us an idea of how they do it. And how they do it is not much different in terms of how we do it nowadays. Like, of course, we have a market today. We have a lot of market interactions. And we can say, well, there's the price of oil. That's a commodity. We can say, what is the price of silver? Of course, there are different types of oil. There are deeper different types of silver and so on. And there are many peculiarities of each one. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a price. of it. Nonetheless, there are some sort of markets that be given that they do not have such a repeated interaction that the price deriving a price in the market is difficult. Say for example, land. Again, land just as in, in the medieval world and the ancient world, it is as difficult now because it's something that holds a lot of value. People want land. That's something that is relatively scarce in terms of how many people demand it. And basically there's a limited amount of land, right? So think about land. You have a house and you want to sell it. What price is the market price of that? You don't know. Or even if you don't want to sell it, what is the value of your house? If you don't want to sell it, then how do you know? How, how do will you find what the price is? There's no market for your house if your, if your house is not in the market. And perhaps your house has been in the market in the past. It has exchanged hands a couple of times every twice every decade or something like that. Still, it's too such a low uh, amount of transactions per, per time. So how do we do it? So how do we do it? Just as basically nowadays people do it. It's just you look into comparables. You look, well, your land is in this neighborhood. And your land has this size. And your house that is on your land has this property, these many rooms, these many bathrooms, so on and so on. And we know that a similar house was sold in this other place that is relatively close to you. Then prices should be relatively similar. That is the more or less the way that we estimate prices today. When you see an estimation of the price of your house worth, that is more or less the way we do it. You will not, not know it. You won't receive that amount because you are not selling it. Only You will sell it and then you will make, put that price tag on your house, but nobody will buy it. And hence, that's not, that's not the value of your house. But you don't know it just yet, because it's no market for that just yet. And so, again, this is a problem that we still have to deal day to day. So that's the same solution that they arrived to. And that, that is how they do it. Now, moving on, a uh, second strand of understanding prices comes from the canonist approach. And here is another quote by Berman in which he emphasizes the Gratian code. Basically, he says that uh, the code by Gratian, written in 140, coupled with the belief in an ideal body of law, made it possible to begin to synthesize first canon law and ultimately royal and feudal law as well. So why is canon law irrelevant here? Why do we are interested in understanding how the church rules itself? Nowadays, it may seem weird, given that the Catholic Church is no longer a preeminent institution within the world, I mean, still very relevant, still one of the most important institutions in the human world, religion is still quite relevant, but it was, it's not as relevant as it used to be almost 1,000 years ago or 500, 500 years ago, right? So why it was relevant is mostly because at this point in time, in the 12th century, it is the church, the preeminent human institution, the preeminent governance institution, and as Berman says here, its law led to the development of other type of laws that influence quite a lot. So in a world that is totally religious, in a world where only the church has the bureaucratic, bureaucratic capability of sending bishops to all parts of Europe, and only the church has the capability of actual legitimacy of actually um, charging taxes for land or for many things, it is in this world where canon law is quite relevant. And it is one area of canon law that really is quite interesting in the development of economics as a science and its own understanding of usury. So as I previously told you, the concept of usury as basically charging 
uh, stratospheric rates for the borrowing in money is something that we also share nowadays. But that conception more or less developed in the religious time, although we now tend to see this in a negative way, because again, if we have usury laws, that means that you are restricting the price mechanism and you don't actually achieve kind of a quote-unquote optimal allocation of resources given our economic understanding of markets. That is true, but that is an economic explanation. When we look this into a moral phenomena, we need to understand why some, how do we arrive into a world where we accept that interest is something that is actually legitimate. That's the thing that we need to discuss. Rufino Sanugacho, which are commentators on Grecian texts, provided some insight into situations where basically selling a higher price was not considered usury. And here again, let's just uh, basically state the fact that usury is just one side of the coin, one side of the coin of the problem of uh, the just price. So usury and non-just price are more or less the same. There's a fair price and you need to consider that. The problem with usury is that you are exchanging money for money. And people have no conception that at the end of the day, that's not the case. Interest is an intertemporal price, a good allocation. So it is basically exchanging today with the future. So money is a medium of exchange. But what people saw, what people see nowadays is that I have $100 and I will pay $120. Why? You, I, I can pay you $100 now, but not $120. People don't realize that $100 now, maybe basically in the present, are more uh, valuable than $100 in the, in the future. So you need to actually make a compensation based on the differences. So $20, that uh, depends on the discount rate of each person involved in the, in the transaction and so on and so on, so on and so forth. But the thing is that there's an intemporal component. But how do we arrive into that? We do not know. That's something that was developed really until very recently in the last centuries. So, but how do we morally justify it? One of the interesting things that Ugacho, uh, Ugacho and Rufino said is that it is not only out of, they say, it is, motive is an important part, just Aristotle said. Motivation of why you engage in trading opportunities is important. Yes, that is true. If you do that to solve your necessities, that is legitimate. But you could do that for other reasons and still be legitimate. If you are adding something to the product, either through labor, expenses, or diligent care, then you are contributing to the public good. And hence, your profit is no longer a negative moral, uh, is no longer uh, sinful. Nowadays, it's a, it's seen as legitimate. And of course, if you extrapolate that to the development of economics as a science, you will see that eventually, as I will say in just a moment, led to some confusions around the idea of what really is economics, what is value, is value done through labor, if there's a labor is a standard that we measure value. Adding things to the product is what makes us actually, uh, it makes legitimate to actually acquire a profit or not. We will see that a lot of the discussions stem from the medieval discussions. So far, nonetheless, still an advance in terms of, of our understanding of usury. Now, let's move to the third aspect, the scholastic theologians. So, Scholasticism, as I previously talked a little bit about it, sought to analyze and understand truths through reason and logic, often using dialectical methods of argumentation. And one thing that is interesting about the theologians is that unlike the Roman, Romanists and Canonists, which are more pragmatic oriented in the sense that they really want to solve day-to-day -day problems in terms of the church as an institution and church as a, 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 not just in the day-to-day -day operations of the church as an institution that needs to receive income, but as a, an institution that needs to legitimize that through church teachings and the Romanist as a civil institution that needs to justify this in terms of solving disputes. But not only that, the, the theologians are interested in basically finding truth for the sake of truth, are interested and basically are scholars really, are abstract scholars that look into the problem of the price determination, not only through the lens of how this is useful for human society today, not through the usefulness of applied problems, but the use usefulness of finding just the truth. And here is where Aristotle basically enters one again into the arena and provides basically the framework of justice to legitimize when determinate prices are just or unjust.
And so a lot of what occurs is that development of the ideas of commutative justice and exchange is more or less subsumed into the idea of commutative justice and price, price determination is part of it. Exchanges, of course, just as Aristotle, are categorized based on motives. If you are exchanges driven by necessity and those that strive by poverty, profit nonetheless still could be legitimate. It's not necessarily condemnable. And again, this is relevant. If merchants offer a public service, then of course they should not be condemned. Yes, they could be that they could be doing this just to become rich, but that's no longer a, 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 a problem if they're actually doing something for the benefit of the rest of the people, especially if there is something that they are contributing to. And this is something that they actually, some the, the theologians add, add up to. They say, and the theologians add to the, to the fact, even if the merchants are not physically altering products, they provide an essential service of transporting it. Well, that's one key aspect that they do. For example, one orange in Florida is not the same that one orange in Alberta, in the north of Canada, and so on. Yes, they are the same good, but given that the environments in which they are being sold are different, one is basically a tundra and the other is the place in which oranges are, are grown, so it's not the same. So if there's a merchant that moves oranges from Florida to Alberta, they're, they're, they are providing some benefit. And most important of it is that they are undertaking some risk here. And here's what actually more or less legitimizes the profit-making mechanism. It's true this aspect that profit is actually now legitimized because the merchant can now lose all of what he has invested for the good of the people. He knows that people in Alberta want oranges. And he knows that it is very troublesome to move goods from oranges from Florida to Alberta, but he does it nonetheless. Now, of course, he's allowed to sell at a markup the price of orange in Alberta compared to those in Florida. Yes, you could say that the, the, the orange in, in Florida has a lower price, fetches a lower price, but they are two different goods and everybody benefits from it. And the merchant is well paid off because the risks he's incurred. Hence, we are now entering into a world where basically merchants are no longer demonized because they are driven by profit because we have seen that profit sometimes is a pay not only to the necessities, but only but also to the risk undertakings of the merchants that actually do it. And they actually provide a good service. So these guys may be motivated by some profit incentive. They want uh, this to be repaid, but they want to be repaid because they engage in risk activities. So, Again, we return to a world by which the just price is determined by the price it fetches in voluntary exchanges. It is through this exchange in the market that we arrive at what is the price of orange in Alberta and why it's so different to the price in, 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 in Florida. And it is justifiable, yes, because the merchant did all of these activities. And of course, I am overly being summarizing here. This is not the... the, the just the work of Aquinas as a theologian. I'm just trying to provide kind of insight into what I think occurred in the medieval world and how we started from some very negative attitudes toward the, for, towards the markets as a mechanism of allocation of resources and the price as the price it should be to our mother, to our understanding that really the fair price, the just price is the market price. And we have solved a lot of the moral conundrums that we have a, a thought in the medieval world and in the ancient world. The, this problem of solving the Aristotelian challenge of determining the appropriate proportion between exchange codes can be mostly well perceived through some quotes that I want to refer. First is Albertus Magnus. He is, of course, the, 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 the teacher of Aquinas, and he's the one that introduces the term of utilitas. There's a dispute, of course, if really this, this term is what directly goes into our moral conception of utility, the utility function, and so on. But he more or less defines the idea that utilitas is a subjective standard by which both seller and buyer individually judges the prices to be fair. Again, market price is the, the just price. And market price is arrived through an exchange, through a voluntary exchange. You have what I want, and I have what you want, and we both benefit out of it. However, 
Alberto Magnus is somewhat confused, as most of these people are in the ancient and medieval world. And so he also adds some considerations of other factors, such as labor and additional expenses are also maintained as important determinants of price. And again, what we are introducing here is the idea that maybe there is not subjective valuation here that equates the price of things. Maybe it is labor or cost of production that actually equate things. And so when people justify why things are priced as the way they are, they say, well, it's because I had to buy these other things and these other things cost me quite a lot. So I need to increase my price. And this is the way that we all, re a lot of justification of business when they increase their prices is because of that. Say, well, I'm selling this because the input that I need in order to give you this is actually higher nowadays. So I need to sell it. So of course, in economic terms, this is problematic because you are introducing a new, another input that is not just subjective, it's objective, it's labor. And hence it produces a lot of problems in terms of how we understand economics. And hence there is a small debate around the community of historians of economic thought about how really the medieval world really leads into the world of the 17th, 18th century in terms of object theories of value. The traditional interpretation by Edmund Schreiber more or less indicates that scholasticism really favored these objective theories of value. Again, the objective theory of value in terms of labor theory of value is the sense that things are valued in terms of how many labor you are embedding into producing one thing. And you measure that perhaps into how many hours have you spent doing kind of things or the more or less the common time, the, the, the appropriate amount of hours that the average person takes in doing things as either marching or recording approaches to, 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 to do value things, right? So Edmund Reyes River believes that that was the case. Baldwin, the scholar that I quoted at the beginning of the lecture when I told you that he was the one that influenced a lot of what I'm saying here, he has a different view. He says that scholastic scholars really are agreeing with a subjective interpretation. In that sense, what he's saying is that scholastic scholars are more much akin to our mainstream current approach to economics that is really subjective in the sense that voluntary market exchanges is what defines what the value of things they are. We still not marginalist approach. There's not marginal valuations here. There's They have not gone that far. That's what makes mainstream approaches from the last 150 years different, but still the subjective apparatus is still there. But Baldwin agrees that labor and other input costs are taken into account, just they are not the primary determinants. And perhaps what we see here is what we 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 think that the scholastic approach would be very similar to a Marshall Marshallian approach of economics, which is to say that the famous scissor in which you have a supply and you have a demand, and the demand re, re, remains basically that it's determined by subjective evaluations about the the, the 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 what I value, what I want as a person. But there's a supply and there are some costs of production there. So that is the famous scissor of, of Marshall, right? So I don't want to go much more in depth about that. I just want to stress that it is the debate exists and it is relevant. Moving on into the second part of the lecture, which I go to more or less try to explain a little bit more about our modern understanding of how we see markets beyond just pure economic framework. And so I'm going to talk into three categories. And this is how we perceive markets to be in the first place. So as I previously discussed, after the medieval world, there's already an understanding that the price is fair as long as it's voluntarily. Markets are accepted. Markets are no longer attacked, generally speaking. There's a general acceptance. That does not mean that some inclinations against the markets still exist. Now, previously I already talked that within the economics profession in the modern world, we tend to think the economics as being a positive science that deals only with positive assessments of things as they are. Now, how does that go into modern understanding of the economics and morality? I think there are three categories here. First, the most common way to understand markets is that they are amoral. And this is the way that I would say most economists think in terms of. Why is that the case? So we think of markets not as agents with agency. They are not individual agents with their own agency. Markets are the result of interaction of many other agents. Because of that, they can have no motives. And because they have no motives, they cannot be moral. They are immoral. They are not bad or good in themselves. People embedded within the market system can be good or bad. Markets cannot be moral or bad, bad or good. 
So that is kind of the traditional interpretation of why markets uh, should not be categorized to be moral or immoral. Now, there are other ones, of course. People also believe that markets are immoral. Say, well, it may be the case that markets really are immoral, but that they incentivize people to be immoral because they incentivize people to commodify certain aspects of life. They degrade certain aspects of life. They, as a community, we humans as a community are degraded by in being engaged in markets. And this resembles a little, a lot about what I discussed in the first parts of the lecture, when we talk about the discussion of organs. So people in certain parts of the world are selling their goods and have become a little bit cynical about how they perceive the market and their own bodies. So market interaction has changed the relationship of these persons with the world beyond just their market interactions. They have changed the relation with the world with respect to themselves. And hence, it has imposed a degrading effect on themselves. And hence, markets are bad, at least in this scope or in these arenas. Now, we have a third category. Markets are morally right. There's where we emphasize that. In fact, moral uh, markets incentivize some good economic behavior, some good moral behavior, sorry. So how is that? Well, markets work through the price system through voluntary exchange. Once you have voluntary exchange, you are in a world where you no longer have to conquer, to kill, to steal, in order to coerce, in order to get what you want. You are in a world where in order for you to actually get rich, you need to make other people's better off. In such a world, you are invested, interested in providing good to the rest of the world. And hence, we stem to the idea that markets improve our own societies because they embed within us some virtue, some virtues that in basically make us more moral beings. And these are the three aspects. I will talk about them closely in just a moment. But if you want to discuss a little bit more about this, you want to read more about it, I would recommend a couple of books. These two first more or less, uh, more or less relate to, to the idea that I to discuss about how really um, at the end of the day, there's a correlation between markets and, 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 moral, and moral virtues, and both of them interact each other. McCloskey, for example, in the world you have virtues, more or less provides a, the, the thesis that in order for the commercial revolution, the industrial revolution to occur in the very first place, in order for the great enrichment to take off, really what they had to occur is for people to stop actually believing that markets are evil. And it's more or less my story as well. It's indifferent. He, he, she talks in, in different ways, but the story I just provided about the development of economics as a profession, more or less follows kind of the similar path. For a man here, it's a similar story with relation to law, like commerce actually benefits law, benefits us all. But these are just two books that talk good about markets. There's a very recent, well, not very recent, but relatively recent book uh, a couple of years ago by the well-known philosopher Michael Sandel, The What Money Can Buy. And here he emphasizes, just as uh, Scott in this book about organs, he emphasizes that there are some markets, there are some aspects of life that actually markets should not be interfering with because they actually degrade. They are repulsive to human beings. They are repulsive to human dignity. And if markets are embedded within transactions in those systems, we are worse off because of it. There's also positive uh, refutations of that by Jason Brennan. I will not be talking about him much, mostly because Brennan will be our plenary lecturer in the next lecture. And there's also this book by Stor and Choi, and Choi, which more or less provides a neat summary of these many discussions about the morality of markets. So, but let's start with the idea that markets are bad. So the first one, which is kind of a weak statement, is that sometimes we may accept that markets work. Markets work and markets are generally speaking good and are moral. But still, we have some qualms about areas by which we believe markets should not exist. And I will say that this is the position that most people are in nowadays. Even those people that believe that markets generally have positive effects. Why? Because we still feel abhorrent, repugnant, that obnoxious that some things are um, traded, like Morgan's, that's made the typical example that I provided in this lecture. 
And May Michael Sandel here says, the corruption objection points to the degrading effect of market valuation and exchange on certain goods and practices. According to this objection, certain moral and civic goods are diminished or corrupted if bought and sold. So we lost our humanity if we engage in market transactions in those in some aspects of our life. We should not be selling our body. Our body is sacred. Our soul is sacred. We should not be trading in those kind of things. So economically speaking, Kimbar uh, provided a, a good uh, summary of all of some of these debates. And when can we expect people to actually think that the markets have gone too far? I started the lecture by talking about price gouging in terms of a hurricane that hit Texas. So that's one of the examples that he has that says that in ex when outcomes are extreme, people believe that markets should not be the proper mechanism for the allocation of resources. That is, in extreme, when, ex when extreme circumstances occur, when people need money the most, when people need, need things the most, markets should not exist. People need water. People need more water when an Yura can just hit your land. You should not be relying on market to allocate those resources. There should be another way, more fairer way to allocate those resources to everyone. The second category is when weakness of agency exists. And what he's referring to here is that sometimes I am not responsible for what I do. So far in the Roman tradition, it more or less irresponsibilizes people as being adults and responsible for their own property. But sometimes it could be the case that you are weak in your impulses, that you are impulsive, that you rely on your own short-term impulses to buy stuff that actually you do not need. Criticisms towards marketing are common because of that. They say, in our modern society, we live in a consumer society, where we are in a system that we consume not to satisfy our need, but actually because we want to appeal to others, because we want to imitate others, because we want to signal to others. It is not a need that we have that makes us buy stuff or go to the markets. We are weak in that regard. Marketing is bad because of that. I buy this stuff not because I want to, not because I need to, because you made me want it to, and that is a problem. So how people actually think about these problems, of course it depends, but nonetheless it's an issue. The third aspect of it, it is when there is an inequality in market relations, when there are differences in bargaining power. If you are a boss of mine, and of course uh, we engage in some interaction, well, there's a difference there. So sometimes there are market power. If you are the only, not only your boss, boss is really more like a hierarchical transaction, when you are the only guy or the only party uh, you are having a mo monopoly or a monopsony, uh, you are the only party engaging in one transaction, then basically I, and I really need what you produce, then I am at your mercy, more or less. And that also causes a lot of moral qualms in, in people. And hence, we actually arrive into the thing that I was previously speaking, that we need to take into account that sometimes morality is a constraint in the way in which we perceive the world. So when we do economic models of the world, even if we are positively oriented economies that we are trying to describe the world as it is, we need to think about moral as constraints, just as we think about technology as constraints or as uh, geography as constraint. If there is a mountain, it's more difficult to move goods above that for that, passing that mountain. If there's a moral qualm about an income, it's very difficult, but you need to find another alternative solutions to that. Alvin Roth, of course, gained the Nobel in 2012 because of his, the, of his work on market design, because he realized that people have problems on, on moral grounds on the markets on, on, on organs. Even if some economists will say, well, that's optimal. We should, people should be allowed to sell their things. But nonetheless, people realize that selling your body actually takes dignity out of you. So that should not exist. That should be oh, that should be forbidden. But nonetheless, there must be an alternative that is also provides more or less a, a solution to the optimal allocation. So that is one economic way to understand market by moral aspects as constraints. There's a stronger stance on markets as monsters. So that stance, of course, more or less identifies the idea that 
it is not just one market, the specific markets that really are problematic. It's all markets. All markets promote or even depend on vices. This is more or less, again, the status of the world as it was for the ancient world that some point, I mean, in generally speaking, in the Christian attitudes, the Atavist attitudes, that's what I'm referring to, that's more or less the understanding. After the Enlightenment, some people say, no, actually, we have arrived into a commercial society, that civil society that is actually civilized, and that is good. But then we have kind of some revisions out of that. The most famous, of course, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his discourse of inequality, which is famous or infamous, depending on how you see Rousseau. In that regard, he thinks that civil society, commercial society, makes people devious and artful because they make people impidious and hard towards others and compels people to treat badly the other ones that if he cannot make them fear him and does not judge in his interest to be of service to them. So what Descartes is saying here is that because markets make people become a mean to an end, it dehumanifies people. And hence, we arrive into a worse a state of the world. In a similar vein, a moral qualm that Marx has is with alienation. He says that unlike what Adam Smith believed that the division of labor would make us just prosperous and is attached more or less to a benevolent way of understanding the world as well, Marx believed that was not the case. Marx believed that if there's a lot of division of labor, then you will become alienated because you would become a cog in the machine where basically you would wake up, go to the factory, do one thing, and just one thing, you would do it very good. You would become very productive doing that thing, but that's the only thing that you would ever do. And hence, you would be, become alienated of yourself as a human being. If a, hu a human being, a real human being, not a slave, a human being is enlightened, is educated, it has hobbies, it has time to read, it has a time to work in other stuff, it has time, of course, it needs to be some sort of productive, but also it needs to engage in those other activities. That what make, that what makes human life worthwhile being lived. Once we have division of labor, you are disattached of the world. You are no longer a human. You are just part of the machine. That is the Marxist critique, the moral critique. Of course, he also, in conjunction with this, he have the exploitation criticism towards uh, the market activities, which is an economic explanation, says the sense that the worker is not receiving the payment to what he does. But that is, that's an economic criticism towards markets. The alienation critique is a moral critique. And these two criticisms from Rousseau and Marx have become quite common in our modern world. And we, have, we hear them being repeated again and again throughout several times. And they are also at as a revision of the commercial society of the 16th century. Now, one common refutation of these two criticisms, one that is, I would say, unfortunate, comes from Bernard Mandeville. And this guy here is a painting that technically is attributed that he's the one that being been portrayed. There are some discussions about that. It was previously believed that it was another person. Uh, I don't know. I'm not this is the picture that I, that I found. But he published this very influential book, uh, The Fable of the Beast, or Private Vices and Public Benefits. It's so influential that more or less has permitted the way in which we defend markets. So when the most common defense of markets, when people hear the alienation uh, criticism or the Russian criticism, is that they say, yes, so what? We are richer now. We are richer. The pursuit of individual gain, self-interest, and consumerism actually drives industry, innovation, and prosperity. It is through that that we have become rich. And hence, we transform private vices into public benefits. And why this is not a good answer, I would say. Why? Mostly because it is not answering the moral claim. It's just saying, yes, these are vices. But once we actually got them into the market, we get rich because of them. So you are answering a moral question with an economic outcome. You are saying we are richer now. We have more goods now than we had in the past. Is that an answer to the moral questions that Rousseau and Marx are, are talking about? No. That's why it's such a dissatisfying. And that's why it creates basically 
a gap into why markets work and why markets are useful and why markets uh, are needed because the, 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 the people that have these, these questions actually do not believe. They may believe that maybe they are needed, but they have a lot of skepticism towards how they work, e e how they produce the richness that they produce. So if they have moral qualms, they will refute anything. So it's not a response. Hence, it's such a unsatisfactory. But that doesn't mean that there is not a response. So we have other ways to see the market. For example, Adam Smith, again, defended the market, not in terms that are often attributed to him. He does not believe that people were greedy and that greedy, greediness were transformed into public benefit. That is the Mendelian approach. And in the theory, in the world of nations, actually, um, Adam Smith does not like it. He's a moral philosopher. He dwells and he likes studying. He believes in the importance of benevolence. He just believes, just as Professor Munger talks us about it in the last minute section, that basically in order for a society at, this, at the level, at the scale that we have in the 17th, 18th century, and of course the one that we have now, in order for it to operate, we really need to have certain levels. It's not just all individual benevolence. In order for the benevolence to really appear at a large scale, you need to have markets. There's not a contradiction between the moral sentiments and the economic society. Both act together. If you want to read more about that, I would recommend a lot of the, the works by Daniel Klein, who talks a lot about that. And also this important book by Bernard Smith, uh, Nobel Prize winner Bernard Smith, which has been very much influenced by Adam Smith himself. So, but besides Adam Smith, we have other enlightened thinkers that also believe in the importance of commerce and trade and market activities. We have here Voltaire, Montesquieu in the middle, and Hume on the other side. And you may have heard about this thesis, it's called the do-commerce thesis. And here Montesquieu, in the spirit of the law, he says, commerce polishes and softens barbaric ways as we can see every day. So what does he mean by that? Mostly he's trying to stress that Basically, commerce and trading activities produce certain virtues that actually makes us ennoble ourselves. There may be different virtues than what we had in our ancient world, but nonetheless, there are virtues nonetheless. We have diligence, frugality, hard work, and prudent risk-taking. These are things that market interactions work. But perhaps more important, and here's where we, I read the, the bottom quote by Voltaire, is that commerce trade fosters tolerance towards people that are different to me. Voltaire says that in the Royal Exchange in London, a place more venerable than many courts of justice, where the representatives of all nations meet for the benefit of mankind. There, the Jew, the Mahometan, then the Christian transact business together, as though they were all of the same religion, and give the name, the name of infidels to none but bankrupts. So while we're in a commercial society, we are no longer in a world where in order to become rich, we need actually to engage in coercion. These differences that appear to be super relevant in the pre-commercial society, such as religious differences in what you believe as to be the God, in, if you, in particularities of race and things like that, are no longer problematic. Why? Because in a commercial society, you are interested in profiting from it. You are interested in doing things that actually make you money. In order for you to engage in, in profit, you need to provide a good. And why is this relevant? You may have, again, still a qualm about that. But commerce ingrain individuals the principles of reciprocity and fairness, primarily to maintain a reputation and continue rep reaping its benefits. So you may disagree about this, mostly because you say, we're still dealing with the fact that people are, uh, are believed to be means to an end. And that is true. In terms of Kantian ethics, that's true. That's why I like this quote by Richard Boyd in a, an edited book about the political economy, Hume, in which when he, he talks about Hume and his program, and where more or less he, he references a lot of what I've discussed about Montesquieu and about Voltaire, and he says, as unappealing as the ideal of mutual self-interest, that is treating other people as means, 
may appear from the perspective of a Kantian ethics of the ends, the act of appealing to someone's interests does have the virtue of taking them seriously as a fellow human being. What do, does he mean by that? Is that I am a merchant, I am a trader, I am in a market, I sell my labor maybe. What do I do? I want to profit from that. Yes, that's true, either through necessity or want. I want to profit from that. But I realize that if I want to profit from that, I have to make a contribution to other people. What I do needs to be value, valued by other people. My labor needs to be valued by other people. What I produce, what I do, my services need to be valued by other people. And hence, in order for myself to become rich, I really need to actually see you as a worthwhile human being because I need to be attuned to what you want. The market makes you attuned to what the people really want. And hence, you really need to take into consideration the other fellow human being. In other forms of production, that's not the case. In other forms of production, either you allocate by political means or you have your own preference, your set of preferences by whatever rationale you have. In the ancient world, it's just conquest. You say, I'm more stronger than you, so I have a right over you, and that's it. So that's what makes market and commercial societies important. What, what matters is the sense that it, even if you I treat you as a means to an end, still it makes me believe that you are relevant because you are a human and I need to take care of your needs in order for you to provide for me. So I would like to end this lecture by looking into empirics. I have not done that in all the session. Looking into the empirics of this is quite difficult because again, just the mere definition of justice, of, 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 of morality is quite difficult. There are a lot of literature on that nonetheless. This is one of the most recent ones. This was published in Nature in 2023. And what this author did, NK did, uh, I'm not going to go into the details here, but what he did is basically he tried to assess oh, a, a measure of how culturally speaking they were attuned to markets in the pre-modern world. And then he co correlated that to some measurements of, of, of the importance of markets and so on and so on. So one of the most important and one of the most studied aspects of relevance of markets and morality is trust. And there's a lot of literature in modern and historical terms. More or less, we tend to think that markets really foster or really are dependent on trust on strangers. Why is that? Because generally speaking, when we engage in market interactions, we are at the, at the, at the expense of the other guy. And if we are repeating interactions, then you build a reputation and then you can basically believe that the other guy will not rescind the contract, will not abhor, will not commit fraud upon you. That's the one thing that we've been previously discussed, right? That is true. But in our modern world, repeating interactions are so rare. Yes, there are brands that build reputation. That's true. You may actually believe in a brand because a brand, but generally speaking, you buy another things and things from people that you will never actually buy ever after and you had never ever before, but you no longer interact with them and you send money and you receive goods. And so in their temporal, the trust in the, in the strangers is a quite relevant and correlated with how markets operate in a given world. That we, this, this is kind of a, a literature that we have known that that to be the case. We may debate about the source of the causality or if there is a causality at all, but nonetheless, the correlation exists. But there is literature for, for all of it. So we know that markets by the same reasoning as the do-commerce thesis may improve on our universalism and our prosociality because we need to take into account the needs and wants of the others if we want to become rich or we want to actually to sustain ourselves in the market. So that makes us more attuned to what the other people want. And so, again, this is just one final piece of the puzzle that I want to leave you with. The sense that there are many there are many debates here about the importance of markets, the moral relevance of markets. I think that we need to take as an economist, as a social scientist, moral qualms seriously. And nonetheless, I do think that generally speaking, markets are 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 incentivized some moral good favor. There are some certain of markets that maybe are do not like markets for organs, 
that we may find morally repugnant. It is not my place to judge or to, you know, to, to, to provide any judgment to that. But I want to stress that this is relevant and we need to take these things seriously in economics. Thank you. Uh,